Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Confidence Connection Show, where we share women's stories of confidence from all around the globe to empower you to live a more confident life yourself. So this week, I'm joined by two amazing Australians. We have Dr. Joe and Melissa, and they're coming to us live, like I said, from Australia. So it's very early in the morning from then. So first up, we're talking to Dr. Joe, who spends her day inside the heads of individuals, teams, and organizations seeking to understand what makes them tick and assisting them to reach their full potential. She calls herself a psychological Indiana Jones, which sounds very interesting. And she describes it as a truly fascinating career that she is grateful for every day. She has a PhD in psychology and over 30 years experience and a breadth of knowledge in the sport, organizational and educational domains. So welcome, Dr. Joe. I'm so happy to have you on the show this morning. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, your background, what you do, and how you got to be where you are today? Sure. Thanks, Bronte, and thank you for um, allowing me to come and chat to to everyone within within your community. So, um, as as you said in the intro, you, you covered most of it. So, my background is actually in, it, it, my background is in psychology. So, um, I am uh, I've, I've been working in the field for um, thirty years now, so quite quite some time. So. I actually came to just very briefly how I came to be because I think that's sometimes what's interesting with people, isn't it? It's the story behind what they do as much as what they do. Yeah. Um, so I was adamant as a teenager at high school that I was joining the police force. That's what I really, really wanted to do. And my my very patient parents would take me to the police academy, which was uh, about 100 kilometres from where we lived, every year for the and, – and by chance in my very last year, which I think is is often how life, life – um, gives us the twists and turns in our lives is a police officer stopped me as I was walking between lecture theatres and quizzed me as to what degree I was going to do before I came into the police force. And I, very confused, said, oh, do you need a degree to come to the police force? And it, I must have looked 12. Um, and he looked at me and he said, well, you do. And I said, oh, what do I need to do? And he said, oh, something to do with people. So I went back to my school guidance officer and said, I need to do a degree. It has to be something to do with people. He said, what about psychology? Um, then he misread the book back then, the, back then before the days of the internet um, when, when you couldn't look these things up in any way other than there was a book that used to come out um, in, in the state that I live in and, and he looked it up, misread it and, and told me to come um, a 1,000 kilometres from my home and I'm still here. I've, ne I've never left. So I studied psychology as an undergraduate by my fourth year um, probably for the good people of my state, I no longer wanted to be a police officer. Um, found my love of psychology, found my particular niche area was performance and uh, sports psychology. So that's what I was particularly interested in. And I was fortunate that within uh, where I live, there was an opportunity, uh, one of the national rugby league teams, for those that follow rugby league, I know you've got a very broad audience, but for those who follow the sport of rugby league, a, a new team uh, started up in our region called the Cowboys, the North Queensland Cowboys, um, and I started with them in 1996. Uh, they went into competition in 1995, and then, yeah, I've been with them ever since. So um, I guess my my foundations is in sports psychology, and then what I've, also, what I've done probably in the last 10 years of my career is in addition to doing the sports psych work is – People are really curious about what happens in sport, how that mental landscape looks like and what, what can we particularly learn from sport that any one of us, you know, you don't have to, I think my message is you don't have to be an elite athlete to think like one. And so what I see my role is, is that I help to translate those lessons of, of high performance for people. Yeah. Well, that's so, that's so interesting. And I love, like you said, there's so many twists and turns in life and, not being fixated on this is what I'm set out to do and allowing it to change and evolve as you start on that journey. That's so interesting. So you refer to yourself as a psychological Indiana Jones. So tell us, what does that mean? Uh, well, probably for me, um, if I if I think on it to share with your audience, probably probably two things. I think I think the, the, the reason that I like to view it like that is I do think that viewing our careers in a curious way is, is good for us. Um, and so I think that one of the things that psychology offers you when you work in that profession is you don't know the mysteries that are in front of you. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan in differentiating between the puzzles of life and the mysteries of life. And I think psychology off, offers us a window into the mysteries of life. So 
and I don't do a lot of individual work now, but when I used to, you know, someone would come in and present to you what were the um, key things that they wanted to explore and discuss. And then what you have to do is kind of navigate your way through and uncover and unpack and work out what's relevant and work out what's not within someone's journey. So it's a real privilege to be able to, to do that. And I think um, that if I continue to look at the work that I do through the lens of curiosity and mystery, it keeps me really interested as well because that's one of the things I've needed to do. You know, by the time you've been doing something for 30 years, you want to keep yourself fresh. You want to remind yourself of, uh, of why it is that you do what you do and how it is that you do what you do. I know, I know there's a lot of talk about, you know, understand your why and, and, I, and I certainly endorse that, but understand your how as well. How is it that you do what you do? Um, I think is is a is a good thing for all of us to reflect on. So that's that's the key reason that I described that. And 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 like you reacted to that, Bronte, is it it piqued your interest when I described myself that way, and you wanted to lean in and say, you know, Joe, what does that mean? Um, the other reason, and this is more of a personal reason, is I have two teenage sons, and every now <laughs> and then they're, they're at events when I get introduced, and it. Um, it gets under their skin when I get described as a psychological Indiana Jones. One of them said to me one day, "You went, Mum, you are so not Indiana Jones." So there's a little, there's a little part of me that chuckles. And and I guess what happens is even when you introduced me before, it kind of centres me to my kids as well, you know, to my boys. And I kind of think, you know, then they're both tucked up in bed at the moment. It is fairly early here in Australia at the moment, so neither of them are awake. But I know what their reaction would be if they'd heard you describe me as um, anything close to Indiana Jones. Yeah, I love that. And I know I definitely remember what it feels like back when you're a teenager and anything your parents do, you're like, no, mum, no, dad, that's so cringe. Don't do that. <laughs> but you're right. It's a great conversation to start and a great way of sort of personal branding and keeping it interesting rather than just saying you're a psychologist. Like that kind of sounds yeah, not boring, but, you know, same as everyone else. So having a way of putting an interesting spin on it gets people asking you more which is awesome so as you said you've worked with elite athletes but also the Australian Defence Force so what's it like working with them and what lessons from that you've taken from working with these people at the top of their game could the everyday person implement into their life <coughs> thank you the uh, universe is probably get cranky at me for calling myself Indiana Jones I've just caught my <laughs> sorry about that um so, yeah, so my I've spent a lot of time working with elite athletes and then um, have, have now, sorry, one more drink of water. It definitely went down the wrong way. Um, so um, and then, then I was invited to work with the Australian Defence Force, which I've done for the last six years. And I guess the reason that I went into that field was because the Defence Force were also curious about what does elite performance look like for athletes and how can that be translated into the defence environment? And what and it's curious, Bronte, because whenever, I, whenever I'm in a military environment, they always want to lean in and say, you know, tell us what happens in sport. And then I go into a sports environment and they go, tell us what happens in the defence force because, you know, it, it, there's this, you know, so the, the defence force want to see into the locker room and the, the athletes want to see into what happens in that military environment because what they recognise is that both disciplines are about performing at your best, which yeah. makes sense to a lot of us. You know, like we may not be in elite sport, we may not be in the defence force, but if, if, if you want to venture out into your day doing your best each day, then why wouldn't you want to learn some of those lessons? So um, what is it like to work in those environments? It's an incredible privilege and I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunities that I've had and I'm also very mindful that in part I've created those opportunities for myself as well. So it, it's kind of a, a mutually beneficial thing. Um, and I guess through that lens of curiosity and curiosity is a word that I use frequently, you know, um, and, and through that lens of, you know, viewing the work that I do and, and how it is that I actually do it, um, I've always been a keen observer and, and I think that's, I think my key message for people to think about is that success leaves clues, you know, and, and we, we, we very commonly focus in our lives on what's not going well and that's, that's a normal part of the human experience, you know, we, um, we're curious observers that, you know, the idea of the, the um, negativity bias that humans often will have has been a survival mechanism for us. So there's no problem at all in noticing what goes wrong but we really need to be mindful and conscious and put some effort into noticing what goes well. 
And, and I think that's one of the things I've been very keen to do through my career is, you know, like if you are a sporting team and you won on the weekend, why wouldn't you pay attention to that? Because it happened for a reason and you want to do it again next week. You know, so in, in some ways we're the same. If our lives are travelling along well, then please pick up the wisdom of why that's happening for yourself. What are you doing? What are the habits that you're creating? What's the environment that, that is happening around you that's allowing you to have some wins because you want to keep replicating those things. So yeah. I think that's one of the things that i found wherever I am. Um, it, you know, and I was talking to a coach last week and they were looking at that. I've got a pamphlet on some of the stuff that I do. And it was the one, by chance he'd picked up the military one and he, and he said to me, he said, you know, I'm really interested in this. He said, I know it's military stuff, but do you think you could help us with this? And I said, that brochure came for the military because I took it from sport. I said, the reason it makes so much sense to you is, yeah. And look, what athletes need, what soldiers need, what performers need, what parents need, what, you know, like what we all need, in, and I haven't anyway done justice to all the different areas where people might work and play, but you know, we're all humans. So, you know, what, what it takes for us to go out on any given day and give our best, whatever that might look like, um, is common amongst humans. Yeah. That's such a brilliant explanation. I love that. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side. We all want to see what's on the other side. But like mm. I said, it's just pretty much the same, <laughs> which I yeah, love. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and the questions people have and the curiosities that people have, it's, it's very common, but we sometimes... We isolate ourselves and think think it's just for us. So yeah, yeah. And I love the whole success leaves clues and reflecting on when you are succeeding because I think we can easily get stuck in a rut where it's only when things go wrong that we stop and reflect and be like, why is it going wrong? How do I get better? Often we just kind of skip over the good times, and so I think it's a great reminder to reflect yeah. when things are going right as well. So, what do you believe the three foundations of high performance are? Oh, well, I, I could give you a long list, but you, you, I know you want me to, we, me to share with you um, three, one, uh, three. And I'm, so I'm going to come from, from my perspective of the psychological space because what I would say, uh, and what I'm about, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be naughty here. I'm actually going to tell you five, and, but I'm just going to say that three That's are mine. Fine. Because, because the, the, ultimately, um, fuel and rest. If uh, before before you do any of the three things, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you about fuel and rest are absolutely essential. That you know you yeah. cannot perform well unless you are well rested and well fueled, and we know that in terms of decision making and a whole range of things. So so let's assume that we are fueled and we are rested and we've yeah. we've spent some time and energy. And I know I make that sound very simple, and I know many people who struggle with a bad night's sleep last night or, you know, have, yeah, I know that people might be hearing that and going, oh, like you say that like that's easy. I know that it's not, but I know that it's important. So let's assume fuel and rest is our foundations. Um, I think for me, if I say them just very quickly and then I can speak to any of them, whichever you think might be more of interest, I think it starts with probably what doesn't sound like the most exciting, but I think is the most important, which is around our habits that um, as humans we make thirty to 40,000 decisions every single day, which is why we get to the end of the day and need to put our feet up because we're tired and we're fatigued. And what happens is our brain doesn't cope with the number of decisions that we make and, and we do about 40% of our every day on autopilot. So what we do is we create habits for ourselves. Um, so I do think what my constant messaging to people when I'm, when I'm working people with, on their habits is that habits are great because they save you from having to think. And habits are terrible because they save you from having to think. So, you know, we, we create habits for ourselves, you know, and maybe your ha habit is that you get up early in the morning and go and do some physical activity. Now, most of us would go, well, that's probably a habit worth pursuing. But maybe I also come home at the end of the day and sit on the couch and have two packets of chocolate biscuits and three bottles of wine. Now, I don't do that, but let's just say that I did. And if I did that every day, that doesn't serve, you know, it's really about what do we do regularly? What you do every day matters more than what you do every once in a while. So how, how well are my habits serving me? So I think habits are the foundation because those are the things we do without thinking. So you get into a car and put a seatbelt on. You don't have to think about it. You go to leave the house in the morning and you brush your teeth before you do it. You don't have to think about it. Those habits serve you well. Um, but then we have habits where, something goes wrong and I tell myself that I'm hopeless, you know, that habit, that habit of thinking and, and particularly, uh, you know, with mind of 
of the focus for confidence for your audience is we have habits around confidence you know and 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 often the question is rather than and, and please 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 don't say good habits bad habits you know we have habits that help us and habits that don't help us so much. So when building helpful habits, it's about thinking, what are my habits around confidence? And that would be would be something probably the main thing. And then the other two things quickly is um, because you said to me um, three foundations of high performance. So it's about the habits that we create. It is about um, and you can turn this in different ways. So attention, concentration, or the term that I often use is mindfulness. So because if you don't, if you're not an observer of your life. You can't change anything. You know, you you keep travelling on autopilot and nothing nothing will ever change unless you pay attention to it. So that becomes very important. Um, so that mindfulness piece. And then and then my my absolute favourite is gratitude. So gratitude is, um, and, and interestingly, people might be hearing this and be very familiar with the concept of gratitude because gratitude is linked to well-being. But in my world, gratitude is also linked to high performance. So there is actually a growing body of evidence that is telling us that grateful athletes, grateful teams perform better. So not only, you know, the whole world would be in a much better headspace if we were all more grateful because we know that that, that enhances well-being and happiness and all of those incredibly important elements. So that's enough of a reason to do it. If you are also in a performance space, so you perform at work, you perform at home, you perform, you know, in your social environment, whatever it is, then walking into it with gratitude, standing on the start line of something and being grateful that your body's going to let you do it, that you were funded to do it, you know, you could afford to pay the entry fees, that the, your part of the world is open and there's even an event on, like doesn't, you know, our, the, like, if the last two years hasn't taught us a lot of things about gratitude, then we've missed the lesson, I think, in some ways. So um, I think those things are incredibly important. Yeah. No, thank you. That's so gratitude's like my ultimate. I love that. It's so important to be grateful. And you're right, that's does breed success when you are grateful. And I think those are great tips that you've shared with us and, Thanks for sharing your story. Now we're going to talk to Melissa. So thank you so much for sharing your story and I'll bring you back on the end to talk some more about confidence. But for now, we're going to speak to Melissa. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you for being here. That's all right. So, Melissa is a transgender authority and advocate who lives in Melbourne, Australia. She's also a diversity and inclusion consultant who managed to get a gender identity policy introduced at various horse racing clubs including the BRC, MRC and VRC. She's also consulted to Cricket Australia in development of their guidelines for inclusion of gender diverse and transgender people in cricket. She's also currently a board director of Sydney-based non-profit organisation, Just Social, and previously a board director of Elder Rights Advocacy in Victoria. So welcome, Melissa. It sounds like you've got a lot going on, which is awesome. Do you want to tell us a bit more about yourself and your background and how you got to be where you are today? I guess um, I grew up in Auckland, so um, back in the good old days, like uh, Joe, with no internet and uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not understanding why I was different to the other boys, uh, wanting to play with the girls, and then dressing as a teenager and doing it a bit in, as an adult in Auckland. But coming to Melbourne probably allowed me to explore that more, a bigger city. Yeah and understand myself so to cut a long story short over a number of years i was working full-time still am luckily i think uh i was living part-time uh as a female but still going to work as a male so i was living two lives if you like <laughs> yeah jekyll and hyde you could say so it came to a point <clears throat> i guess uh seeing my dad dying that i decided i've got to live be true to yourself and live full-time they trying to live, lead a double life all the time doesn't really work. Yeah. It's like no. having an affair <laughs> with someone whilst you're still married. So um, I, I just made that decision. And I guess from that point on, as I went through the transition process, it made me realise you can make a difference in the world, just um, like the gender identity policy at VRC, just getting that introduced whilst I was transitioning. I just thought it was the right thing to do, but it made me realise you can make a difference in the world. A lot yeah. of people think, I can't. So just by doing little things each day, uh, having a routine each day, um, even the last couple of years helps. 
And from that point onwards, I started doing stuff in the media, um, talking on radio, and I talked on TV about Hannah Mansi on Studio 10, so that was quite good to do. So, and just writing articles either on LinkedIn or uh, getting up at three in the morning, talking on a yeah. blog place, radio station, an uh, online station in Florida. That was quite an interesting thing wow. to do. <laughs> Reached out for a copy. Yeah. But it, it, it develops you, develop my writing skills, I guess, because you've got to learn to write articles and stuff. Like, haven't done as that much of that this year. Um, mm. You start to feel a bit of a burnout by doing it for so long and trying to create change. But over time, um, I managed to do that. Speaking at the National Employment Solutions Conference, just talking about transitioning in the workplace, how to deal with someone transitioning the workplace, and then doing another talk, talking about gender diversity policy and how the importance of actually having a policy to that yeah. enables uh, gender diversity in the workplace, which obviously extends to society and your social groups as well, if you think about it, and how you've got to have the practical stuff there as well, and people actually got to promote it, not just have it sitting on the shelf there, um, yeah. hanging like a coat hanger in the background, just sitting here in the lounge, you know, so, it, <laughs> you know, so just, like this thing that just hangs there, nothing it does nothing, you know, if you don't move it. So, if you don't move yeah. the policy and create uh, opportunities for that to occur within the organization, then it's just not as well not have it. So, doing the practical things as well, bit by bit, and encouraging people to have conversations one on one around diversity and inclusion. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And a question that comes to mind, I guess, is how young were you when you knew either I don't know what the right term is whether it's you wanted to be a woman or that you were a woman born inside a man's body sort of how I guess young were you when you actually truly knew what you well, were when I was 10 years old I knew it was different to everyone and yeah um, on the same vintage as Joe I guess no internet in those days so you didn't understand so if I think no. back if I had yeah. internet I had what was going on um fully and then i thought oh and you try and bury it as well because you think oh no yeah. I'm, I'm a girl um from that age you try and bury it so even in the early 20s going out night clubbing trying to do the masculine things playing cricket and yeah trying to bury it but it, it, trying because you think oh that's not really me it's just you know, it's just a phase or something but it's not so yeah. and i'm glad now we've got the internet it's so much easier for kids yeah. now and i think uh this generation kids that really know who they are, like my generation, perhaps we weren't as in tune with ourselves as the current generation yeah. of kids are, if that makes sense. So, um, I think no, I think that does make sense. And I guess I love your opinion on, which I think I already know the answer to, but <laughs> it's a lot. I hear a lot of talk about as parents, whether they should let their kids transition earlier during puberty so that, you know, it's, it, works out better or whether they should let the kids wait until they're 18 and an adult you know before they truly know mm. to start transitioning so what what do you I mean everyone's different but what do you think about that I think it should be case by case I think mean, the parents yeah. will know they're yeah, talking to psychologists I think it's probably better that if they start start earlier but obviously there will be some exceptions where it's better for them to wait till 18 and I think it's very hard to have a one size fits all. Every, yep. you know, yep. every individual is different, and talk to the kid. They want to start puberty blockers, and then talk to the psychiatrist, psychologist, and Royal Children's Hospital. Melbourne's really good with that sort of stuff. So, and, and they'll work it out. And in most cases, it's probably fine to start puberty blockers early, but there might be some exceptions. So, everyone's yep. an individual. You know, I think it's important. Yep. People often forget that in that debate. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And how important do you believe it is to have a transgender authority and voice in different industries? I think it's important because it's a new thing and there's still an element of fear in society, I guess. I get it walking around here. You can see it in people's eyes. They still feel a bit fearful or don't yeah. understand. So um, a, lot, a lot of anything new, I know with the gay marriage debates, we got dragged yeah. into it. So um, you've got to... A bit of abuse in the street which was lovely not really but <laughs> uh it's it just makes you realize that yeah it's like the gay marriage debate and what they went yeah. through years and years ago and now <clears throat> that's what's happening with trans issues i guess and people yeah. are non 
Polly. So it's just all all a new thing for people, and people feel a bit frightened, and we're still still in the pandemic and still haven't quite come out of it yet. So people are still scared anyway, or tired and flat. So yeah, it's important. There's a voice out there, or voices out there, just to allay those fears. Yeah. You know, it's a good way of looking at it. And that I think we will continue to find these new, I guess, let's say obstacles, but these new ways of learning and accepting more kinds of people, which, you know, can only be good for the world. So what's been your biggest challenge? I mean, I'm sure you've faced a lot, but what's been your biggest challenge that you've overcome or faced so far? Uh, just, I suppose, that during the pandemic, trying to get my breast augmentation surgery done, there was a real... Trying to yeah, getting the money out of super, going to the psychiatrist, getting the letter. It's like a real challenge doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, transitioning itself and changing the documents, that was a huge, huge thing to do. But you're yeah, going through that uh, process and then, um, you know, huge thing, obviously, like having breast augmentation surgery or even having them reduced. If you're a female and them reduced, it's a huge decision to make, huge thing to do. And, um, just, yeah, going through the process, getting approval, getting the money out of super, it's quite quite a bit of a draining experience and you feel tired after surgery anyway and just gotta try and rest. Yeah. So um, yeah, just overcoming people's uh, attitudes or un uh, unconscious bias, subconscious bias would be a better word. Um, yeah. In terms of, who you are and how you look and if you don't if you walk down the street don't wear makeup then obviously people look at you differently again so it's interesting yeah you know what I mean so yeah and on the flip side what has been your biggest accomplishment so far I think going on Studio 10 was pretty cool and um yeah but it's more the the day-to-day -day things helping people from people overseas online and helping always remember someone talking to someone on Messenger one morning on the way to work about uh, helping their ex-husband transition and get, you know, reaching out to someone in London through LinkedIn, a large network that there and just finding um, someone to help them and resources for them, I guess, and finding some groups for them to help them. So that gives you more, a lot of satisfaction, sort of hidden things. Um, and doing a modeling course with Tanya Powell modeling agency which is good at the moment so it's another thing another learning yeah. curve as well so and that's um obviously to help my confidence as well so it's yeah been knocked around like everyone else's the last couple of years so, yeah. that's cool so how have you seen the transgender acceptance improving over the years it's slowly getting better it's been talked about more but there's still a long yeah. way to go i can see on social media some of the comments i get or people will send a message Oh, you just want to curve on women and children. You just ignore the comments. So no, I think still, still that um, issue out there. So, yep. so it, it's improving, but I think it'll take another 10, 20 years to, for for it to be truly understood yeah. or accepted by people because I think it's just not normal. There's only male or female, and that's the way a lot of people think. Which I, I get that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think the internet is obviously a great advocate in one regard and then can be bad in the other regard to, um, you know, helping awareness. But you're right, with time we should get there, hopefully. And how can people in the workplace show more acceptance towards transgender and the LGBTQIA plus community? Oh, very well. <laughs> um, very good. Uh, so I guess... Just uh, put yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, when you see someone, even, you know, you see someone in a wheelchair or you see someone, LGBTIQ person, A plus person, just think of what they're going through or trans person, they're, they're yeah. probably having a hard time and you see someone just not smiling, walking down the street, they may be just as afraid of you, talking to you or even saying hello to you on the street. So just having a bit of empathy, yeah. I think, is really important. I think that's one thing out of the pandemic we need to have uh, some bit more empathy and kindness towards each other. Yeah, no, definitely, I agree. And if you could get one message across, what would it be? Uh, treat others with kindness. I think out of the pandemic, something I learned as well, you sometimes forget that even yourselves, you're running around, you're working from home, and 
learning to reconnect with people. So it's going to be hard coming out of the pandemic, probably people reconnecting with each other socially. And it's interesting to see that in some places, most people reconnect quite easily, but some might struggle to do it. So have a bit of kindness for those that are struggling with that. And maybe have lost their job or their business because of the pandemic. Yeah. And so before we bring Dr. Joe back on to talk about confidence, do you have anything else you'd like to share on the topic of transgender? I think on the topic of transgender, it's just around um, that it's still a bit of a way to go. Like I've obviously done some speaking, writing on the issue, a bit of consulting on the issue to make it easier for organisations. But I think it's important that you recognise there might be someone in the community that community and the society, if there's not someone in the workplace who's trans, it's important if you just don't assume, ever assume anyone, if you see a male, they're not yeah. non-binary, so just if you say, oh, hi, how are you, meet them in the I can ask what your pronouns are, so just being courteous and polite and just being respectful as well, that's important in treating yeah, others with that. respect. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's such a good message to share with everyone, so thank you so much for sharing with us about your story and how you got to be where you are. We'll bring Dr. Joe back on. Hello. So Hi. I'll ask a question to both of you. So I'll start with Joe first and then Melissa, you can answer afterwards. So Joe, what does confidence mean to you? Uh, that's such a great question, isn't it? Because I do think it's a foundation for, for so many people, which obviously is why you have, have this community focusing on the, on the topic. I think I think actually it picks up on a lot of what Melissa was just saying within um, within some of her conversations around it. it I think self confidence comes from self acceptance. I think that's a, yeah. for me that's a big part of what allows you to be confident. That even in the wobbly moments, that you know who you are and you feel you know you, you trust yourself that whatever it is that you'll 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 come through that situation. So I think for me it, it, it it's a lot around that self acceptance. Yeah, I think that's a great I, answer. I and what about you, Melissa? What does confidence being, mean to you? Uh, just being able to believe in yourself. And I guess I do, I've done a lot of, I've done some coaching through my transition uh, with Tanya Lacey and her company and Lane Beachley recently, last year, whilst I was recovering from surgery and taught me the importance of I am and yeah. saying that each day that I'm beautiful in the shower and I'm enough, those little things each day. And I know the other night it was first night back at the modelling class after 12 weeks, I was feeling a bit nervous, sounds silly, but just um, just felt, I don't know, I don't know, just had, you have those moments you feel a little bit teary or whatever. So I just got, I went to the bathroom, broke the sort of mindset of it. And then I was just walking around trying to get my modelling walk right and just saying I'm beautiful and sexy. And saying those things to myself as I'm walking around mentally and the gradually started to get better and it started to sink in and the body started to start to actually walk better. So it's just all those little things that you yeah. do um, and recognising where you are. It's okay to be in that space. It's okay. And then it's just trying to move it. Yeah. And Joe, how do you help people build their confidence? Um, I Again, I'm going to pick up on something that Melissa's providing me with all this gold to lead into. So thank you, Melissa, for all, all, all the wisdom that you're sharing as well. I, I think with the, um, the, the people that I'm often working with, particularly athletes, a lot of their life is, um, is uh, acknowledged by other people. So, for example, if you're a sporting team, you're on the back page of the paper and people are critiquing you according to your performance. And so it's yeah. so easy for your confidence to come from external places, So, which is fine when you're winning. But when you're not winning, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a bit more of a tricky thing. So I think that, you know, with the example Melissa just gave, confidence Confidence comes best when you anchor it within yourself. It's lovely if you are yeah. on the back page. I always say to my athletes, you want to be on the back page of the paper, not front page of the paper, because you're normally in trouble if you're on the front page. If you have a trophy in your hand and you've just won the premiership. But the, ch the challenge for all of us, I think, is to anchor your confidence within yourself, that it's lovely to get, you know, the compliments or the accolades from others. And it's lovely to, to you know, and enjoy that when that happens. Yep. But where you can is to build your confidence from within because you've always got yourself. 
And that's what Melissa just said. Yeah. Melissa said, you know, a wobbly moment, you take yourself out of the situation, you anchor yourself, you remind yourself who you are, and then and then you go again. And you don't need anyone else to do that. So, it, you know, we, we want to be kind to others. We want to support others. We want to do all of those things and help build people up wherever we can. But ultimately what we want to do is we want to start with that for ourselves because that will be enough. And then anything else we get is the yeah, the cream on the cake and, you know, and, and take that when it comes along. But trying not to rely on it too much, I think, is one of the things. It's the juggle. It's the juggle of, of, of managing yourself, I think. Yeah. And Melissa, Melissa, how do you help people build their confidence? I think I just uh, encourage them to be themselves, self-care. Yeah. Picking up what Joe just said about you know you've got to be kind to yourself first and support yourself first, so then you can support others and be kind to others. So if you can encourage people and just say hello to people and just doing the little things daily, which helps you as well. So and then just talking to others and <clears throat> just telling them they look beautiful, even if, if they you can sense they're not feeling great. So just remind the other person of of their qualities, good qualities, and often, yeah. you know, as Joe said before earlier, we often get, even myself, you know, think, oh, why did I do that? You know, that's so negative or, you know, and we forget the good things we've done and the positive and celebrating the wins. We forget to do that a lot. And we forget to reflect as well. We've got to remember to do yeah. those things. That's great. And Joe, what would you say to someone who's wanting to build their confidence but doesn't know where to start? Okay, uh, so I would say first of all, be gentle on yourself. You know, so 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 know that it's a you know we're all a work in progress and we're all working towards these things. And I think where I would start is I would start again. I'm going to use my use my word I've used a few times. I'd start off as the curious observer, you know, and 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 the question I would ask myself is before I work out how am I going to become more confident. Where are the gaps for me now? Where am I feeling less confident? Is it is it within myself? Is it within my work? Is it within my social circumstances? You know, like where where do I feel like it could grow? And what might that look like? And starting off very, very small. So it's not about doing a complete sort of mindset overhaul and changing everything for yourself. But just, again, come back to remember how I said how important the habits are. So little habits of confidence because that's reaffirming for ourselves. So, you know, it might be about going and asking someone a question if you're someone who would normally hold back from saying something. So the little acts of micro bravery, I think, are really good. So I would, I would, I would look in the mirror first and see where where would I like things to be different, and I would try and build on little habits. And like I said, not too many. Just just start off small. And I, I, for me to hold all that in my head, I would need a notebook. So I like to I like to journal and 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 to use those sorts of records. So that's probably where I would start but and 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 um I think as Melissa said you know the world is a different place now and there are resources on the internet so again use that with discretion but you know there's lots of great stuff out there that you can access as well so um I would I would be I'd be becoming more informed in that area I think that's great and Melissa what about you what would you say to someone who's wanting to build the confidence but doesn't know where to start just start with one thing at a time one one little habit, as Joe said, each day, just one one little thing that will just make you feel better and feel a little bit more confident and just build on those yeah. micro things, you know. And when you come home from yeah. work, um, hang your jacket on your coat hanger. <laughs> don't, don't, you know, don't focus on your work too much. I've done that in the past where you just bring your work home with you, oh, yeah. don't hang it up and put it aside and focus on you. So it's just a gradual thing of, doing the little thing, just do one thing a day that will make you feel better and just slowly build on it over time. And if, and if you do that, in time you'll become, gradually become more confident. You just take like baby steps is probably the best way to describe it. Yeah, no, that's so true. And Joe, what's something you know now that you wish you knew when you were younger? Oh, so many things, so many things. Um, <laughs> Uh, so where would I start? I think I think like I love mantras, so that that's a big thing within sports psychology is to have a, a phrase or something that you come back to that helps to anchor you and it helps you know it helps with your confidence on days when when you need it. So um, I think probably 
if I was talking back to younger me is to remind myself that pretty much in life that I, and here's my mantra, is that I always land on my feet. You know, that when when life comes along and deals me a curveball and it doesn't quite go the way that I want to, to, if I feel rejected in some way or someone says no or something goes wrong, inhale, exhale, I'll land on my feet. So I think that probably is the is the phrase for me because and, and the reason that I know that is that I'm still here now, you know. So I had a I had a birthday last week and so I've been on the planet now north of fifty and um and and yeah, I know. Um, uh, it was a, it was a big year last year. That gives it away, doesn't it? But but you know, like I land on my feet. <laughs> you know, humans are actually pretty resilient. We get through most yeah. stuff most of the time. So inhale, exhale. I land on my feet. That would probably be what I would have if I could go back in my TARDIS and talk to twenty year old me. That's what I would like to tell myself. That is awesome. And Melissa, what about you? It probably would be. Uh, it will get better. I think. Um, yeah. yeah, when you go through a transition, it's going to be quite tiring and lonely. You can lose family yeah. and friends. So just reminding myself that it will get better. Um, and often, you know, I bumped into someone just out of the blue. Met someone as a lawyer the other day, just randomly after getting the nails done, just sitting next to them outside at a bar. Um, so you meet those little moments in life, you meet someone that helps you. And then I went over to their place and they gave me a whole lot of clothes, which was really nice, which I could never afford to buy. So just all those little things, I think, but it will get better if I could have told myself that 20 years ago. Yeah. And Joe, what's the best advice you've been given or your favourite quote to live by? Mm, that is a great question. Okay. Um, yeah. So my favorite. Oh, see, I love quotes. No, no surprises that someone with a sports psychology background loves quotes. I had to when I wrote my book, I had to narrow it down to my favorite twenty, and that that was hard enough. Yeah. Um, so so I, I I do like the land on my feet, and I do like success lead clues, and I also um, I I heard a great one last week that someone in one of my workshops was talking. We were talking about the concept, you know, that when it feels when life feels like there's overwhelm, and and the the, the way it was once described to me, I was telling this group I was working with, it was a def defence group, and I said someone used, I knew used to be an air traffic controller and so they used to say, yes, but it doesn't matter, Joe. no matter how many planes are in the sky, you land them one at a time. And I went, oh, that is so good, you know, you land those planes one at a time. Anyway, so I was, I was telling the group about this and, and someone said, it's like when you're fishing, you know, you deal with the cross that's closest to the boat. And I thought that's a very North Queensland thing to say, you know, you deal with the crop closest to the boat. But I think it's it's that kind of message of there's lots going on in our lives and, and you know, working out the importance of it. So that's probably that something along those lines is my favourite. <laughs> yeah, that's great advice. And Melissa, what about you? Uh, it probably a bit more simple, uh, not as analytical. <laughs> uh, it, it takes courage to be yourself to be yourself and draw strength from your inner self to be yourself, to be your true self is probably my apt, simple quote. Yeah. And I think that's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Awesome. And Dr. Joe, what's your favourite book or podcast that you would recommend? Maybe um, it's your own. <laughs> well, that I, I thought that would be a little self-serving, so I didn't think I'd recommend my yeah. own. Um, oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, so, well, yes. Um, so definitely The Elite by Dr. Joe. Um, so no, no, my favourite book is always whatever is the one that I'm currently reading because I, I, I love reading. Although my go-to every year is I do like to revisit The Alchemist by Paul Coelho. I, I love that book. But I've just yeah. finished a great book and, and the author's name always escapes me. So I've actually got it sitting next to me. It's written by Rutger Bregman and it's called Humankind, A Hopeful History. And what oh, that yeah. book actually did was took all the... Um, I'm going to say infamous psychological studies and psychological experiences of the 1970s. So the Zimbardo prison experiment, the Milgram shock experiment, you know, the case of Kitty Genovese. So all of those and those experiences are often viewed through the lens of, you know, when good people turn evil. But this book yeah. flips it yes. and says, actually, where was the kindness and what, and what does this really say about humans? And it's a, it's, it's called Humankind, A Hopeful History. Actually, I've got it sitting right here because I didn't want to forget the author's name. But um, yeah. it was a great read. Like it was really, I guess I'd spent many years looking at those studies and kind of thinking, oh, that was terrible, some of the things that happened there. But it 
it, it causes you to think about it differently. And I think anything that causes you to think differently is great. My favourite podcast at the moment is a, a fairly new one that's just started up through the Atlantic. Um, Arthur Brooks uh, brings that together and that's why I did write that one down. It's called How to Build a Happy Life. It's only about seven episodes in, How to Build a Happy Life, and that's got some great messaging and interviews on that. So those, that's what I'm listening to at the moment. Yeah. And who's your favourite or who are your favourite people to follow online to spruce up your uh, social media feed? Yeah, look, I, I, I have a really eclectic and wide range there. So, I mean, there's, it's kind of all the usual names that people would know. Yeah. But, I, I, you know, I, I, like to, I like to follow people on LinkedIn and, and you always come across different stories and experiences there. So I, I tend to keep that pretty broad. So. Yeah. So what, whatever crosses my feed usually, which is usually a reflection yeah. of whatever I'm clicking on, isn't it? It's all it's all clickbait. <laughs> yeah, no, that that is true. It is all clickbait. And Melissa, what's your favourite book or podcast? Uh, probably from Good to Great by Jim Collins. So it taught me a lot about leadership and you know if you want to be a level five leader or level four leader. So it taught taught me a lot about yeah. that sort of stuff that I wasn't before. I did um, my LGBTI leadership program, doing that as well. Oh. So it helped. Um, as well as leadership and leadership skills so, and having difficult conversations as well. So that was an interesting thing to go through. And yeah. And who, who are your favourite people to follow online? I just follow, similar to Joe, follow whatever LinkedIn, whatever grabs <laughs> my LinkedIn. And if I see an article there I want to read, I may not necessarily be yeah. brand. I follow a lot of different people. I've got a large following myself there. So, um, yeah, just trying to keep up with what's happening overseas in the trans community. But other th subjects yeah. may come across me with women's rights and stuff. So I just yeah. pick it up and read the article. Yeah, that's great. Joe, where can people find you online and connect with you? Uh, all the usual flavours of social media. I tend to be everywhere. And and the, the good thing, I, I kept it very simple. Um, if you can remember my name, then you can find me. So... My website, my Facebook, my LinkedIn, everything, it's it's all under it's all under my name there. So Joe Lucan. So Joe Dr. Joe Lucans .com and so forth. But if you if you put that into a search engine, you'll you'll find me or yep. or some of the some of the media work that I do. Great. And Melissa, where can people find you online? Uh, I'm on Facebook under my name or the real Melissa Griffiths. I've created a whole lot of pages there because I used to get blocked by Facebook years ago when I shared articles, so I've got a whole lot of pages there now. Uh, just so I could get my message out and they didn't block those pages, but they used to block on other sites and groups. Oh. And uh, I'm in a lot of groups, so to try and yeah. share the story on Facebook. I'm on Twitter as at Melissa Racing. Uh, if you Google me, you'll find me anyway, find the website. Yeah. And I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, as well. So all the usual places, Snapchat, Instagram. So. Yeah. Yeah, easy. And uh, Joe, before we go, do you have any final words you want to share? No, I just wanted to say thank you for um, including me within within the conversation today. And and I hope for for all of your community, you know, to travel through your day and travel through your week with kindness and gratitude, and that will certainly help us all on our confidence journey. So thank you, thank you for having me on on the show. You're welcome. And Melissa, have you got any final words before we go? Well, thank you for having me on the show, Bronte, um, and just add to what Joe said, just remember to be <coughs> empathetic towards others and um, just put yourself in other people's shoes and just take one step at a time. Someone reminded me yeah. that the other day, which is so beautiful, they said, you're on, a, <coughs> you're on a big journey, so just one foot in front of the other, and it just you know, really resonated with me at that time. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you both for joining us and thank you to everyone who's watched either live or on the replay. And we will see you all next week. So have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.